Hi, this is Natalie Lander, voice of Kinsey, Tara Branford, Stargirl, and many others. You are listening to a W2Mnet podcast. You can visit W2Mnet.com for other podcasts about entertainment, video games, sports, and wrestling. Okay, that actually didn't make air, so I'm not really worried about it. Good evening, afternoon. Whenever you happen to be listening, everybody, and welcome to the kickoff, a presentation of the W2M Network. I'm your host. My name is Harry Broadhurst. Joining me, as per usual, the executive producer and your anchor man, Eric Watkins. I thought my name was Toby. Not even going to dignify that. The unprofessional in every sense of the word, Jason Teasley. I'm here. I've got beer, and I went. Th- I went to thirty thousand dollars in debt yesterday for the wife. One way or another, you always pay for it. Some of us just pay more specific ways than others. Isn't that right, Eric? Not Family. the <laughs> I was about to say I haven't even spent thirty grand in my entire life. Not to mention with my current situation, I actually talked myself into a freebie. I was waiting for you to family show me for that one. <laughs> You're the one that gave me the setup. Come on now. It's baseball season and I'm hitting them out of the park. <laughs> Much like the Braves did tonight against the Mets. Booyah. And the Riz, Randy Isbell. Hello, hello. Come on, personality. We need personality. I got, I got nothing. I can't beat any of that stuff. We no one says you have to beat it. You just have to tie well, you could beat Eric, but, you know, a lot of places frown upon that. I feel like beating it in public is probably not the best idea either. Yeah, you might shoot your eye out. <laughs> I mean, besides, every now and then, well, I don't know. Because, I mean, if you have the right equipment and you're in the right situation, a little All right, beat- all right, all right, all right. Let's, a Christmas story in July was far enough. Let's move forward here. So we kind of come up with a, ten, a tentative plan for this particular week's episodes. Due to the fact that we missed our original planned record date for last week, and we're going to try to work two episodes into this week to get back on schedule. Tonight's episode, as will be noted in your show description that you will have seen at the top of the show, is going to focus on continuing our greatest of all teams feature as we move to the AFC West. Denver... Oakland, Los Angeles, Oakland, Los Angeles, Las Vegas. No, you added in an extra Los Angeles. Did I? Yeah. You said Oakland, L.A., Oakland, L.A., Vegas. You're right. Oakland, L.A., Oakland, Oakland, Las Vegas. You're right. You're right. I did. Kansas City, who are the easier one, I guess, of the teams in this division. Well, I guess Denver's been Denver. Well, Denver's then, always been Denver. Kansas City used to be the Dallas Texans, and then that was with the uh, and that was with the uh, the uh, merger, right? Pre-merger, because they went ahead, beat Houston in the '63 AFL Championship game, then they moved to Kansas City. Hashtag quit it. <laughs> Hashtag taking a nap. And. Uh, also, Los Angeles turned – well, San Diego turned to Los Angeles, the Chargers. Yeah, so we'll you had that correct. Sh- we'll be getting to those shortly. In addition, we wanted to let you know that there will be an episode forthcoming later this week before Jason goes on vacation, thus probably fucking us for an episode next weekend, where we focus on all of the news and notes from around the National Football League. And apparently, Mr. Anchorman – It's been quite the week for news and notes. National Football League, and if you think that's bad of what's going on in the National Football League, the college ranks are even worse. The word of the day is quarantine. Hashtag deep tease. And we might even chime in on the goings on in the NBA as well, because Lou Williams, you're a fucking idiot. I mean, I get the whole situation with the hot wing delivery, but this, bro, 
I mean, granted, I can't talk because I would rather have the party come to me in that case, but I would be at least a little more clandestine about it. Can't be getting caught doing that, what he did. Trust me, we'll explain that story on our Wednesday or Thursday episode, recording time to be determined. However, with this particular episode, we are going to continue the greatest of all teams. And while we were going over this, a couple of names stuck out to me. A couple of franchises stuck out to me. However, the very first person we're going to discuss was an absolute lock between all four of us. There is no dissension in this one. We start with the Denver Broncos. We start with offense on Denver. And, I mean, it's the man responsible for the franchise's Super Bowl rings. It's... John Elway. And let's be fair, three out of the four Super Bowl losses, but you got to get to the Super Bowl in order to lose it, right, Harry? That hurts, Harry. <laughs> um, Jason, make sure you take him jogging, please. I will. I'm on. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. No back problem. to the uh, back to the Broncos here with. I, mean, I, was, I said I was taking Jake Plummer. You're hilarious. <laughs> Eric, we'll, we'll go to you with your thoughts first for, for John Elway here. Not only was he the face of the franchise when he was playing with the team, now he's the face of the franchise running the team. I mean, for everything that he's done since he became general manager and created architecture for another Super Bowl win and actually... Yeah, another loss as well. John Elway, for someone who is normally, as the saying goes, great players don't make great coaches, and great players not all the time make great executives, he's really defied that because for all of the memories and going back to the older fans, you know, what happened with the drive, what happened leading up to the fumble, finally winning back-to-back -back years, one of those actually... The road to the Super Bowl went through Jacksonville for the Broncos, so there was a little bit of extra pain in having to deal with him. Although, granted, I knew we were going to get our asses whooped. It was actually closer than I expected. So, with John Elway, I mean, who knows? Could he get into the Hall of Fame really as two different parts, both player and executive? I don't think there's any question he'll go in as a player. The executive None at all. Thing to be determined. Jason, your thoughts on Elway as the quarterback for Denver? Oh, I mean, a nine-time Super Bowl, I mean, a Pro Bowl, three Super Bowls. I mean, he was, I mean, his football knowledge is off the charts. Um, I mean, he threw for 300, uh, 300 touchdowns, uh, 51,475 yards with a career of 56.9 completion percentage. And he was the heart and soul of the Denver Broncos. And once he left the field, he became the heart and soul of the franchise, literally, when he went to the front office. So, I mean, there's no doubt that uh, Elway was my pick. I mean, anytime you think, uh, I mean, a lot of other names come to mind, such as um, Shannon Sharp, Terrell Davis. But, I mean, it all still goes back to L.A. Yeah, I was going to say, my honorable mention from Denver is going to be Terrell Davis for what he was able to do in a short time with the franchise. Shannon Sharp has arguably one of the greatest careers put together by, by a tight end in uh, NFL history as well. However, we'll be talking about his superior a little bit later on in this broadcast. And he looks like a horse. Dramatic reverb. And Shannon Sharp, and Shannon Sharp looks like a horse. That being said, I don't recommend listening to anything Shannon Sharp has to say on ESPN these days, or Fox, or wherever he is, because frankly, it doesn't matter to me. Well, I mean, it's actually better than Skip Bayless. Skip and Shannon undisputed weekday mornings on Fox Sports 1. Again, I mean, better than Stephen A. Yeah, that, that's not a hard bridge to cross. Randy, your thoughts on the career of John Elway? It was super long. Honestly, I, I think I would have went Terrell Davis myself if he, he didn't have so many injuries and only basically played four seasons. But no, I mean, when you if if you just ask anybody that doesn't even really follow football, you just say Denver Broncos, they'll say John Elway. I mean, obviously the face of the franchise, like you guys said, 
not only as a quarterback, but a GM. I mean, I don't think there's really any other choice. So I, I think that's why we all went Elway. You do realize that this that Elway is part of the draft class that has now produced three greatest of all greatest of all teams. The famed class of eighty three. I had to double check to remember that. <laughs> Elway, Elway for the Broncos, Kelly for the Bills, Marino for the Dolphins. And the Jets didn't draft any of them, but still drafted the quarterback in the first round. Poor Todd Blackledge. That wasn't him. Different guy. Wasn't it Ken O'Brien? It was Ken O'Brien. Oh, I was thinking of Todd Blackledge oh because he actually had a worse career than Ken O'Brien. Oh, oh my God, I got one over on Eric. Oh, my God. That never happens. Well, yeah, I knew that the Jets drafted Ken O'Brien because Blackledge had his career with the Chiefs and the Steelers. But let me ask you this, Randy. Is one of Ken O'Brien's career highlights a snap hitting him square in the helmet? Hey, you cannot be a Jets quarterback if you do not have a, a mess snap or kind of some kind of folly in your history. But Mark probably. Sanchez, yes, exactly. I, I knew I, I knew somebody was going to step on the Sanchez reference. Mm-hmm. Well, no, no, not all Jets quarterbacks have had that those kind of moments. Look at Tom Tupa; he had a hell of a time at Jets quarterback. <laughs> um, I can tell you about a Jets quarterback who had a rough time off the field. Hello, Geno Smith. <laughs> we don't we don't acknowledge Geno Smith. We just <laughs> acknowledge him for his collegiate career. <laughs> the West Virginia amongst us is getting angsty. All right, let's switch hey, over. Hey, hold on, hold on. You forget, Pennington is also came from Huntington, where I live. Marshall, and yes, was uh, until if his injury, uh, him being injury plagued, he would have been a fine Jets quarterback. He did. He was a serviceable one when healthy. And Dolphins fans, thank you for letting him go so that way he could lead them to a division title. Is he still in Miami? Pennington? Uh, yeah, Pennington's retired. Ben retired. Okay. Yeah, Pennington. Well, it's not going to matter for uh, Miami because now they have the flying Hawaiian, as Jason likes to call him, or as me and Eric like to say, uh, his actor. I don't like the flying Hawaiian. I call him Akuna Matata. His actual name, Tua Tagovailoa. All right. Yeah, beans of disease to you too. Maui Wowie has also been acceptable on this show. Uh, I do call him Maui Wowie too. Let's move over to the defensive side here for Denver, and we actually have a split team here. Jason, I will let you go first, and then I will let Randy follow because you guys are the dissenters. Uh. Defensively, I'm going, I mean, Atwater, who is one of the, you know, most punishing uh, safeties in NFL has ever known. I mean, he's up there with the likes of John Lynch, Ronnie Lott. I mean, any time you came across the middle, you was putting your life on the line to meet Steve Atwater. I mean, uh, he was selected in the first round of the 89 draft. Uh, seven straight uh, Pro Bowls and eight overall. Uh, his one gap there was 97. Uh, named to the NFL All-Decade team. Uh, I mean, one of the most glaring things um, that that water done, and, you know, you can look this. If anybody hasn't ever seen this, you know, if you're a younger NFL fan or something, uh, look up the hit of um, of uh, the Nigerian nightmare, Christian Okoye, that Atwater laid on. And Christian Okoye was not a small individual. He was a big punch back. And Atwater uh, delivered a hit that left a stadium of nothing but oohs and ahs um, when it replayed on the Jumbotron. So uh, I advise you, if you haven't seen it, please go look it up. And judge for yourself why, uh, anytime you stepped on the field uh, across from Atwater, you was pretty much putting your own career on the line. Randy, if I'm not mistaken, you agreed with Jason with Steve Atwater. Yeah, absolutely. I uh, newly appointed into the Hall of Fame. Fantastic career. 
eight seasons with multiple interceptions in each season. Just ridiculous out there, exactly what Jason said. Uh, it was a big presence in that Super Bowl that we were just talking about with John Elway on, on the defensive side. So, yeah, I think it's that one. Eric, we had this conversation off air, and while we admit to possibly cheating a little bit here due to the circumstances of the other team, for the player that we're picking, his contributions to Denver can't be denied as well. Both myself and Eric went with John Lynch. I mean, even though it was a much briefer stint with Denver. Four seasons. Yeah, three interceptions, nine forced fumbles. Defended 26 passes, 7 sacks, which as a free safety, I mean, come on. That's pretty impressive. So, admittedly, I will give an honorable mention to Atwater, but Lynch is my guy. I will openly admit that part of the reason that I took this is because Lynch's other team has a much more obvious selection. See, I don't don't think... See, I, I was looking at Lynch to be the, uh, you know, spoiler. Uh, I was pretty much Lynch being my pick in that division. I thought about uh, it myself, but. The mm-hmm. only, only, only with him, with, you know, I don't want to spoil anybody and take anybody's pick for the future episode. But that was my honorable mention. I went back and forth between those two players, but I was, uh, I'm. Lynch, to me, defined that team with his stint, and he's more known on there than he is the Broncos. I, I, would, I would agree with that to an extent, but at the same time, I think if you were to ask fans of that brand, I mean, we might as well tell everybody what we're talking about because we're going to discuss it next time we do Greatest of All Teams anyways. We're referring to Tampa Bay, and the, the battle for Tampa Bay is going to probably come between John Lynch and Warren Sapp. And there's a couple others that you can mix in as well. Because believe me, but, we've already foreshadowed Tampa Bay going back a ways on the offensive side. Oh, yeah, we did back when we did the redacted, didn't we? Yep. So available in the archive over at Spreaker, Stitcher, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spotify. We're on the, we're on the W2 uh, network on W2M. The W2M net. network at W2Mnet.com. Thank you, Jason. Uh, Randy, without going too far into detail, do you associate Lynch more with the Broncos or with the Buccaneers? Oh, Tampa Bay, by far. See, I knew there's a reason I like bringing Randy on the show. I, I mean, I, I get why you guys want to put him on there because you, you don't think you're going to have him at Tampa Bay, but, but Harry, are you going to have Joe Montana as Kansas City's quarterback because you had Jerry Rice as your nomination for San Francisco? No, because so I thought... It's the same thing. But I think Lynch, I think Lynch brought a attitude to that Denver defense as well when his time there too. Yeah, but for four I'm, seasons, I, w- I would. I'm sorry, I'd put Champ Bailey over, over yeah. him for Denver. I would put Von Miller over him. I was just okay, about and to, to my, and to my credit, I was even going back to the '70s Orange Crush defense gate days and giving a shout out to Tom Jackson. But it's like. Uh-huh. But, but Tom Jackson is on Team ESPN. That's where I remember him from. <laughs> my, uh, my honorable mention for Denver and the man who might still be the greatest of all teams for Denver all time is Vaughn Miller, if he can continue at the rate that he's going. Easily. Easily. Because that's that he's been an all-NFL, Pro Bowl-type player every single year. The only thing is, is Vaughn Miller doesn't have – Maybe doesn't have the national acclaim that a guy like a like a Steve Atwater or like a John Lynch had back in his heyday. Eh, give it time. I mean, chasing chickens around will get you somewhere at some point. Rocky Balboa proved that. Thank you. And for us wrestling fans here, Vince McMahon proved that as well. That reference was just for you, Randy. Thank you. Did you appreciate my three-minute warning, Jeff? I did. I actually had it loaded up. I was going to play it when I came in, and then I forgot. <laughs> All right, so let's move on here. That takes us to K for Kansas City. And Robert Taylor's heart to be damned. It is unanimous offensively here as well with the greatest tight end in NFL history, Tony Gonzalez. Jason. Jason. 
Yeah, I mean, Tony G was the the um, standard and has been the standard of tight ends. Uh, so I don't. It didn't surprise me. I mean, I do have an honorable mention to somebody like uh, Jamal Charles, Priest Holmes. Um, yeah, I mean, but Tony Gonzalez was. Uh, he revolutionized the tight end position. I mean, we did talk Shannon Sharp, and for everything Shannon Sharp contributed, um, it was taken to the next level by um, Tony G, and even taken to a higher level once Gronkowski entered the league. So, I mean, that's three tight ends uh, that set a bar pretty high for anybody coming into the league to even uh, try to attain. So... I mean, that's three three legitimate Hall of Fame names. But I think Tony Gonzalez is, uh, I mean, the standard of tight ends um, in the NFL period. Fifteen thousand one hundred and where's the exact number? One hundred and twenty seven yards on one thousand three hundred and twenty five catches. Seventy three career touchdowns as well or excuse me, 111 career touchdowns with a long reception of 73 yards, averaging 11.4 yards per catch. Here's the bigger thing for me when it comes to Tony Gonzalez. Gonzalez played 16 years in the league. 17. He missed, he missed two games. <clears throat> That's insanity to be that consistent at such a position where you take such a thorough ass whooping. I know Robert's going to listen to this and think, Oh, you guys aren't mentioning Mahomes. Um, Patrick Mahomes has been in the NFL for two seasons. Three. Two is a starter. He yes. played one game. He played one game in his first year. Yeah. Hey, hey, listen, we couldn't even get Jason to put Russell Wilson for the Seattle quarterback. And he's been in the league for like nine. So, I stand, yeah, exactly. I stand by Steve Largent on that one. Yeah, well, we yeah, have... but, but here's the thing. If we're talking quarterbacks in the Chiefs, I mean, yeah, Mahomes is getting there, but uh, Lynn, Dawson, Lynn Dawson and my mm-hmm. honorable mention for offensive player, Ed Podolak, really? Really? <laughs> Eric with the deep cut there, Lynn Dawson, I know. And, and since Randy did bring it up, we did have a definitive answer on our – Poll that we did around last oh, week. Not closed yet, technically. Yes, it did close. Uh, it was uh, Russell Wilson, seventy-six to twenty-four percent. This is some bullshit. Look, outside of that hundred touchdown catches in two hundred games and a milk commercial with Jim Zorn and Jerry Rice wearing his number eighty with his blessing in Seattle. Would you really have known about Steve Largent? Oh, oh, speaking of Jerry Rice, fuck you, sir. (laughs) He knows exactly what I'm talking about when I say that, too. To to, to, to quote Moana in the movie, what can I say except you're welcome? (laughs) All I will say is, uh, since we do have a, uh, the poll is currently up and running. And we'll be up for the next 24 hours, uh, ending at uh, about 11 o'clock on July 27th. So if you do hear this in time, please go vote uh, at W2M Chairman and uh, vote and chime in on the, the split decision that we did have on the Denver defense player. Look at Jason being a professional. How dare he? Does this mean that we're going to be in a point to where we'll start getting paid for this eventually? No, no. I'm, still, I'm still drinking on the job. Oh, okay, and, never mind. And he, has, and he has two Jeeps he still has to pay off. We're fucked. <laughs> yeah, I've been, dead. I've been dead to fucking Chrysler for quite some time. All right, let's, um, let's get back to the uh, greatest of all teams, however, here. Real quick before we do that, to my point about Eric. We had the great... De- we had the, uh, the debate last week about Montana and Rice. And yeah, I'll admit that Montana is perfectly acceptable as a choice. But this motherfucker. <laughs> picture for Montana for the show. 
<laughs> doesn't even notice that Jerry Rice is in the background of the photo until I point it out to him. <laughs> I laughed so hard. And I was immediately thinking as I was looking through, it's like, do I want to be a dick? Do I not want to be a dick? Photo of Joe Montana holding the Super Bowl trophy from the exact game we talked about. Photo of Jerry Montana or Joe Montana and Jerry Rice standing next to each other. You can see which one I picked. We'd like to thank the executive producer for his contributions <laughs> over the last four seasons and wish him all his future. <laughs> I don't oh, know. Yeah. Hell, it took us a long time to to replace <laughs> replace the guy that didn't show up. Imagine how long it takes us to replace a producer. <laughs> oh, Randy Stark, Kansas City defense. I right, think it was even a decision, wasn't it? Yeah. I mean, was there any other choice than Derek Thomas for for the Kansas City defensive player? Mm-mm. Uh, no. I mean. Uh, as a Giants fan, I mean, I'm a huge LT fan. Uh, that you know, that did get the greatest of all team. <laughs> Fuck you, Harry. Um, so, I mean, the other linebacker that is comes to mind when you think of an intimidating individual is Derek Thomas, and I, his career was cut way too short um, due to a, wasn't it a horrific car accident that? Uh, that he passed away in? Way too short, yeah. Yeah. But I, wasn't he still playing? I don't believe so. I think he no. was. It was the season after. Yeah. I, I, was, I was thinking it was it was in the I was thinking it was in like the twilight of his career that he uh had the accident. And um yeah, I mean Derek Thomas is I mean, he was a force. Number four overall draft pick by Kansas City in the 1989 NFL Draft, where he spent all 11 of his seasons. Nine Pro Bowls and holds the record for the most sacks in a single NFL game with seven. In addition to that, let me go down to the bottom here so that way I can give you some even more specific stats about his career. Got it, 33 years old. 642 career total Total tackles, 126.5 sacks, the Kansas City franchise leader. 41 forced fumbles, 19 recoveries with 161 return yards and four touchdowns. One interception and 19 passes defended. We talked about Steve Atwater. We talked about John Lynch for Denver. With all due respect to Atwater and Lynch, not even in the same class of player as Derek Thomas was. 19 fumble recoveries, five defended passes, twice led the league in forced fumbles, and, passes defended. and led the league in 1990, 20 sacks. Yes, his, sec- his second season in the NFL, he led the league. We mentioned the uh, we mentioned the consistency of Gonzalez as well. The same can be said for Derek Thomas. In all but in all but two of the seasons, he played all but one game. There are only two seasons in his eleven in his eleven year career where he played fewer than ten games, ten or fewer games, and that was exactly ten. So, and I won't go ahead, Randy. Then I'm just trying to. We were we were joking about Robert Taylor and Mahomes. So I messaged him while we're on the podcast. I had to know his his answers. He said clearly the the defensive player is Derek Thomas. He agrees with us, and of course he his offensive player is exactly who we thought he was going to pick. He already says Mahomes is the best Chiefs offensive player, but he does say that he would have taken Christian Okoye or Jamal Charles over Tony G, which is interesting to me. Oh. No. I, On, well, I gave, nobody, nobody claimed that Robert Taylor was fucking smart. I gave an honorable mention to Jamal Charles, Jamal Charles, in addition to Priest Holmes, much like Jason did. But Christian Okoye didn't play in the league long enough to justify a selection for the yeah, greatest. And, team. and I, I feel Christian Okoye was pretty much a glorified fullback rather than a, a pure uh, H back. 
And besides, look at who was throwing to Tony Gonzalez. Does anybody remember Elvis Gerback? I, I do, just because I remember trying to figure out how to fucking spell Gerback. G-R-B-A-C. Yeah, I know that now. <laughs> but I want to chime in here, too. I mean, for everything Thomas did on the field, it was some of the things that he did off the field that also factor in to the legacy left behind. I mean, uh, he did found the Derek Thomas third and long foundation uh, to basically quote unquote sack of literacy and change the lives of from nine uh, nine to thirteen year old urban children fa- facing life uh, threatening situation and illiteracy in the uh, Kansas City area. So I mean, you know, Wikipedia. Uh, I mean, you have to look at he won. Did he win like Player of the Year? Um, man of the year. Yeah, he won man of the year in 93. So, I mean, we can sing all his praises on the field, but he was also an outstanding citizen off the field. It goes even further than just winning the man of the year in the NFL. The Kansas City man of the year award is named after Derek Thomas. For good reason. It tells you everything you need to know about how the franchise views him in hindsight as well. All right, so after a pair of unanimity picks, things get a little suspicious when we head out to Las Vegas, as is bound to happen. Hey, 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 hey. Certain things are legal in the Las Vegas area. Damn it, I stick to it. I was more waiting for you to make a Bovada reference there, but okay, whatever. Well, again, with Bovada, the LV is for Latvia. That's completely different. Although, granted, you can bet on Bovada anywhere thanks to their website. They've got some really good promotions going on right now. Especially for those who are into Bitcoin. As previously mentioned to anybody who's listened to the show, we cannot be bought, but we can damn sure be rented. All right, let's move over to the Raiders. And this one sparked a little bit of controversy here as one of us was not happy with the running back that ended up being selected. I will let him give his pick first, and then the actual running back who won will be the last person mentioned. Go ahead, Jason. I mean, I'm not going to say that I'm not happy about it, but, I mean, I think that, I mean, with all due respect to your guys' picks, I'll go Bo Jackson. I mean, the athletic freak whose career was cut short by the same injury that Akuna Matata has suffered, but back then when he had the injury, uh, medical uh, treatment was not what it is today. Also, uh, that also shifted the look of football fields and baseball fields sharing the same stadium. So, I mean, I'm going to go Bo. I mean, Bo knows everything. Bo knows Diddy, Diddley. He knows the... um, he knows Michael Jordan and Wayne Gretzky on Saturday morning cartoons. He, he knows he knows Nike. I mean, Bo just knows. But like I said, I mean, I think uh, my my runner up and honorable mention was your three uh, guys' pick. Uh, but I, I just feel I thought I, I thought it was three to one. I'm, I do apologize. Um, so I mean, I'm I don't. I think that Bo Jackson is synonymous with the Raiders organization, but I will bow out. I'll take my lumps and take my loss and not be bitter about it. I'm still bitter about Jerry Rice. I ain't going to lie. Anyway, um, real quick to in regards to your Bo Jackson thing here before we get Randy's pick. Um, my issue with Jackson is longevity, and I know that we've kind of had that discussion a couple of times before. Bo Jackson is a case of what could have been had he decided to focus on football because he put up monster numbers at the University of Auburn and then put up really strong numbers with Oakland until the injury occurred. And I think that Jackson is going to be one of those great what-ifs in NFL history where if he would have picked football and stuck to it, he could have been an all-time great running back, not just necessarily an all-team great running back. Uh, well, I mean, you can make that argument because with all of this and with what Bo knows, is he an athlete that's played in both a Super Bowl and a World Series? No. 
Did he hit a home run and score a touchdown in the same week? No. Did he dress for a football game and a baseball game both within 24 hours? No. Could he have done a lot of these things had it not been for that injury? I think it would have been pretty close. So I'm not going to say, oh, if he had stuck to football, this is what he could have done. I think had it not been for that injury, we would still regard him as a much longer playing, but still very excellent two-sport athlete. Randy, you avoided the running back position altogether with your selection. Yeah, I, I, I went with Kenny Stabler. I mean, I mean, great quarterback, MVP obviously in 74, gave him a Super Bowl. Uh, it was, to me, it was, Bo Jackson just didn't play long enough. And I like Marcus Allen, which, which you guys will talk about here soon. I, I just, Kenny Saber, obviously before my time, I, I think got to, I, I wanted to give a rub because Allen already had it won by the time I had made my pick. So, like, so I gave it to Stabler. Well, I gave my honorable mention to all the wait, quarterbacks wait, and kicker. Wait, 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 wait. We're, we're about to discuss that in a second here, Eric. Okay. All right. Because I actually had a build into that there. So Randy mentions his picks towards the end right as we're getting ready to record because he was at home when we did our announcements ourselves. And Eric and I have been discussing this ever since we did the episode last Tuesday as far as what our picks for the AFC West were going to be. And the quarterback that both of us came up with, Eric, was... The Mad Bomber himself, Daryl LaMonica. Now, again... Over Stabler and quarterback and kicker George Blanda. Go ahead, Jason. I actually want to change mine to Rich Gannon. Have you used an opinion? I got, I got it. I got. I, I popped. I popped two of you. Eric, Eric just rolled his eyes. I can see those. The, I can see that they rolled. You, but you the other two of you got to get a laugh. You got a groan from me is what you got. To be fair, Gannon did play two more seasons with the Raiders than Bo Jackson did. So, there, he's got him there. Oh. Ooh, Randy coming out firing. All right, Eric, our pick and the winner for the Oakland off- or Las Vegas. Sorry, old habits. The Las Vegas offensive goat is running back Marcus Allen. I mean, can, can you beat, what was that, a 75-yard touchdown in the Super Bowl against the Redacteds? It was a longer Super Bowl MVP, Super Bowl MVP for that game as well, I'll add. Mm-hmm. So, Six-time Pro Bowler, two-time first-team All-Pro, second-team All-Pro in 1984, NFL MVP in 1985, Rookie of the Year in 1982, Comeback Player of the Year in 1993, but I believe that might have been with Kansas City. Yeah, and and to think, draft night, he was on the board. The Houston Oilers call, say, hey, how'd you like to block for Earl Campbell? And he's like, well, I don't know. I'm thinking, why don't we sometimes like run and block for each other? Click. The rest is history. 12,243 yards. Hold on, let me get the exact number correct here. I don't want to screw this up. It's a lot. 123 touchdown. That doesn't sound right. So if I can, should be. 123 touchdowns. It feels like that number should be higher. Well, 90. 21 receiving touchdowns as well, so. 5,411 receiving yards. So a grand total all-purpose yardage for him of over 17,000 for Marcus Allen. Granted, the final five seasons were in Kansas City after he left after he left Los Angeles, Oakland, Los Angeles. I think Los Angeles specifically at that point. Uh, NFL records. Consecutive seasons with a rushing touchdown, 16. Consecutive seasons with multiple rushing touchdowns, 16. Consecutive seasons with multiple Randy, touchdowns. Randy, watch out. There's ghosts behind you. Consecutive seasons with multiple touchdowns, period. 16 tied with Irving Fryer. 
oldest player to score 10 plus touchdowns in the season. That was with Kansas City, however, so not really worth expanding upon since we're discussing him with his accomplishments with the Raiders here. It is an impressive list of accolades for the Las Vegas Raiders' greatest of all time team offensive player, Marcus Allen. Let's switch over to the defense now, and we'll start with Eric. Now for this one. I went back in the archives like I do. Mentioned a man who had a bit of a tragic end to his life in Lyle Alzado. But then I realized, even though the team wasn't always known for defense, which I realized, during those times, especially the Los Angeles years, there was one man who you could argue not only was a great anchor for his team, but have you seen the offspring that this man has produced? The one, the only, 84 career sacks, Howie Long. Randy, you're in the same boat here. Hey, don't you mention he was, he was a big actor in Firestorm. Hey, Firestorm was a great movie. I, I'm not saying it was bad. Saying that we can't forget that he was in that. No, I mean, Eric said it perfectly. 84 career sacks, eight-time Pro Bowler, Super Bowl champ. I mean, <laughs> lineage with his, with his kids is, is just perfect. It's great. Uh, uh, no, how, uh, it was it was way tougher for me to pick an offensive player for the Raiders than it was defensive. I originally didn't pick the person that I ended up going with. My original selection was simply known as the assassin, Jack Tatum. However, once Jason brought his pick to the group, I realized that, and especially as a modern fan, and we've had this conversation before when we've done greatest of all teams as modern fans, that when it comes to the Raider franchise, in my lifetime specifically, the standout defensive player is none other than secondary member Charles Woodson. Jason, do you have the accolades in front of you, or are you in the process of acquiring those right now? I'm getting getting them pulled up right now. I was trying to get them pulled up. Um, All right, well, then let's talk about the fact that Charles Woodson, before he even came into the NFL, did something that very few have ever done by being a defensive-focused player to win the Heisman Trophy in college. Let's talk out of, about... Out of, from that team up north. Yeah, TTUN. Well, I'm, I, I don't care. I'm not an Ohio State fan, so I can call it. I'm not State. either. I, I'm not either, but I have bad blood toward Michigan, so I, I fuck, say fuck Michigan every time I get. And if anybody knows that reason why I have bad blood toward Michigan, I don't want to open any old wounds. I am drinking. I may start crying. Muck fish again. There you go. There you go. All right. Do you have the stats ready? Yeah, two, in 254 games, uh, 65 interception, three-time pro, uh, three-time All-Pro, one Super Bowl champ, nine times Pro Bowl. Um, career um, interception, 65 yards, 966, 11 touchdowns. I mean, he was a beast in the secondary, uh, and this is goes back to a thing that we. That I really want to recap once we get everything, uh, all this, uh, all the teams knocked out is to see, because we tend to go one or two positions uh, for each pick. We we tend to go uh, either a defensive back or a quarterback. So I really want to look at the numbers once we get done uh, recording. But I mean, I I mean I can name a lot of other people like you know La Zato. Um, Howie Long, but I mean, when I think that, I think I feel personally I have to go with Woodson because I did see a lot of his career, and I think that's what does sway me a little bit. Randy, you weren't here when we originally had this discussion, so I kind of want to get your thoughts on here. Jason, if you want to, you can work on the poll at W2M Chairman for Howie Long versus Charles Woodson. You'll notice the generational gap here. Do you think that for people such as ourselves, who all fall into roughly the same age bracket, we're all within about five or six years of each other, give or take? So do you think that maybe for people like us, it comes down to people that we've actually seen play more so than somebody historically that we haven't? 
Yeah, I, I think that's a big part of, of my picks. Um, I, I tried not to, obviously, with Stabler trying to, to change it up a little bit. Never saw him play live. But I think it's in any aspect when you're coming up with your greatest of all time, whether it be football players, baseball players, wrestlers, or whatever, anytime I do stuff like this, it's and it's almost always those people that I grew up with. So I, I tend to lean towards somebody that played in the 90s over even somebody that played now. I mean, because that's the stuff that it, it gets stuck in my lore. I mean, if Bo Jackson would have played longer, and I, I'm not even like against Jason's pick of picking Bo Jackson for the Raiders, even though it was just four years. Because as a kid, man, Bo Jackson was everything. I mean, plays plays him on on Tecmo Bowl and just run around forever. It's, it's human cheat code on Tecmo Bowl, right? So I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's just human nature to to pick somebody that that you saw live. Uh, Eric, like I said, we've had this discussion before here. Any, um, do you think that our picks are kind of portraying that, given the fact that a lot of us have focused on players that we would have seen in the 80s and 90s, be it live as kids ourselves or through ESPN Classic back in the days when we were growing up? And that's a big part of it. <clears throat> I mean, I know I do personally lean a little bit towards that because, again, a lot of memories of my childhood and going back in the day when – I started watching sports, but I think for those who like, especially Jason, like myself, like others who take the time and appreciate that little extra history, they'll be more willing to go ahead and include those players that they wouldn't have had a chance to see live. So it's a bias naturally, but it's one of those biases you can kind of remove if you have the predilection. That makes any sense. Look at Eric busting up the ten dollar words on this podcast. I haven't done that in a while, so I'm due. Plus, I'm sober, so that also helps. That makes uh, one of us. So let's actually kind of touch on that, though, because um, before we move on to the last team that we have to discuss, and I'm giving Jason time to post the poll as well. So before I move on to the last team that we have to discuss here, Randy. Your your franchise was one of the very few who had a player back from that golden era of the NFL back in the 60s when we selected Joe Namath as our greatest of all teams. Do you think it has to be that generational kind of player who either leaves an indelible oppression on mainstream society or is just so good that you can't deny it? Like we, we, we gave a shout out to Roger Staubach for our greatest of all teams for the Dallas Cowboys. I mean, I think with Joe Namath, it helps that I mean, the Jets have been so abysmal. As, especially offensively, that there's that really not another one you could pick. The only one that I could really think of as far as the Jets go was Curtis Martin. But, I, I mean, even then I couldn't really put him over Joe Namath. I, again, he's he's so over the top, yeah, giving the Jets their only Super Bowl and being such a, a character himself. But, yeah, I mean, I think I would have done the same as you guys. I would pick Dave Aikman over Erstall back because, you know, I grew up with Aikman and watched him. But it'd be interesting to – to have somebody of that generation discuss that, which I guess um, is what we get out of PTI and all that crap. Um, we actually didn't pick Aikman. Oh, who did you pick? Emmett. Oh, oh, Emmett Smith. Well, I was still out of the two quarterbacks. I would yeah, take I mean, we, we, but yeah, I, I see what well, you're saying. Yeah, Smith too. We mentioned we mentioned Aikman as well, but we also gave a shout out to uh, Roger Staubach at that position, just because none of us had the ability to see Staubach in his prime. None, yeah. We only caught clips and highlights of him on, ES, on ESPN Classic, whereas myself being a Bills fan watching the Super Bowls growing up, I got to see Emmett Smith and Troy Aikman kick our ass twice. Or if you're like me and you happen to find versions of, oh, I don't know, the entirety of the 1970 NFC Championship game, but I'm me, so... Eric deep dives on YouTube for old NFL games and he got me hooked as well. You're welcome. So, can I go back real quick and just make a defense against Charles Woodson real fast? No. Absolutely. Go no. for it. Of course Eric is well, going to say yes. Cause he picked- I, I, I just want to bring this up, just just because I want to be fair. While I do, when you say Charles Woodson, the team I think about is Oakland. While you guys are talking, I looked at the stats. His best years, by far, were in Green Bay. And he got the ring. Well, you got to consider what he was playing with in Oakland compared to what he was playing with in Green Bay. 
Well, I don't know. I mean, with that Oakland team that got to the Super Bowl, granted they were more known as being the number one offense in the league that year, there was still something. Plus, lest we forget a certain game with certain snow, when a certain referee made a certain decision that helped a certain quarterback, that I would love to put his Ugg boots right up his ass. But I digress. Fuck him. Anyway, all right, let's get back to our greatest of all teams here. You are listening to the AFC West edition here on the kickoff, a presentation of the w 2 Network. I'm Harry. You're listening to Eric, Jason, and Randy as well. We are to the San Diego, Los Angeles Chargers. I don't know why I paused there. I was, Los I Angeles, was, San Diego, Los Angeles, if we're being fair. Basically, it is a franchise that can't make up their damn minds. And now they play in a soccer stadium because of it. Or at least they did. Well, I've hey, got, blame, got, blame ownership. For you. <laughs> Offensively, it's going to be fun. I will admit I lost this battle. I'm okay with losing this battle because the, the person who won this battle would have been one of my honorable mentions if he had it. Hold on. Hold on. I, I, I must have some. Hold on. Hold on. I got to get through this. I gotta get through this ad first, but uh, I'm about to say uh, because I don't think we can afford Doctor Evil's reign on this network. No, um, that's why I said, "How about no?" Um, so this is this is all I have to say about the Chargers, and that is. Oh, uh, this ain't Aaron. Why is it not gonna play it? Okay, here we go. No, that's not it. All right, we're going to get and, to the Oh, here we go. Oh, yeah. What I'm talking about. Start the theme song. San Diego Super Chargers. All right. Is, is, there any, is there any other jersey better than their baby blues? Hell no. Oh, no. Now, I'm... see, this is why that we call Jason the unprofessional. Had he been a professional, he could have just messaged me and said, Hey, could you get the San Diego Superchargers clip ready to go so that way we can play it on the show and not have to worry about risk being sued? And I would say, absolutely. I'll let you know when it's done. You give me the cue. Everything will be copacetic. You know, kind of like I did with E.T. last week. Thank you. (laughs) We can just take into consideration Jason's drunk and don't give a fuck. And he is a... And he's a partial owner and he does whatever the fuck he wants. We're in as the... (laughs) As as you proclaimed me, the HNIC, and the head of sports programming here at the network. Open your eyes. The views and opinions of Jason Teasley do not necessarily reflect those of us here at the W. Son of a bitch. I had a glare on my screen. Anyway, back to work here for the Chargers here. Um, This is kind of an interesting one on multiple levels for me. Because there are a lot of names that could have been considered here. And I'm surprised that actually there is a player for San, for San Diego, Los Angeles that none of us mentioned, given the fact that we just had such a noteworthy discussion about tight ends just a few moments ago in Kansas City. None of us picked Antonio Gates. Because there's so many people that when you think of the Chargers, you think of certain people. Mm-hmm. Gates, Gates is in that conversation, but he's... Like just like a sport, he's not the immediate player that pops to your mind. No, and I think that, that that needs to that also factors in to where our greatest of all teams does have to factor in because when I think of the San Diego Chargers, I think of my pick on both sides of the ball instantly. Okay, defensively, I agree because defensively it was unanimous, and we'll get to that in a second. However, offensively, I disagree with you guys. I know that he ended up winning this particular poll, but I disagree. For me, when I think of San Diego, I think of the consistency of their quarterback, and I think of Phillip Rivers. The There's fact- Ron why, did I not, why did I not pick Phillip Rivers? You didn't pick Phillip Rivers because you selected his running back for most of no. his No. There's also another reason. 
What what led to Philip Rivers becoming a Charger? The whole Eli Manning situation. Exactly. So, and with uh, San Diego at the I'm time, wrong. not wanting Drew Brees. Correct yeah, and – and, uh, that of Eli not wanting to play in San Diego that led to him getting traded to New York? Yes, but that's that's part of it. I mean, the Chargers organization didn't even want Rivers. Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. To the pressure of Eli, they buckled to the pressure of the Manning family. Don't get me wrong. Rivers – is a great quarterback, but he, he, I, it, to me, he falls in the Alex Smith category. He's good to maintain a game. He's got, but I give him credit. He's got intensity. He's got his own damn football team that he can practice with, with all those damn kids he has. That's like, sure. like in the state of California, you can have 15 people over your house that means he can only have three friends come by to visit at one time because he's got so many damn kids. So, I mean, you got to take into that. I mean, he's intense. He's a leader. But I don't think of him when I think of the Chargers. I think of LaDainia Tomlinson. Well, you guys will be able to present your case for LaDainian Tomlinson, who actually did win the uh, conversation because there were two votes for LaDainian. I picked Rivers. We'll get to Eric's selection here in a few moments, who I can't deny either as one of the faces of the franchise. Real quick, the stats for Phillip Rivers. 4,908 completions and 7,591 attempts for a career completion percentage of 647 59,271 yards for an average completion of 7.8 yards, 397 career touchdown passes, 198 career interceptions, an almost two to one ratio, which compared to a certain Manning that landed in New York dwarfs his career stat line. We talk about, we haven't specifically talked about him yet, but we will talk about him next week. I don't think this is going to go for. Uh, yeah, I see the point to the ring. I know Eli has two. Philip doesn't have one. I get it. Rivers was good enough that the that the Charger franchise felt they could move on from Drew Brees. No, Drew Brees' injury made the Chargers feel that they could move on from Drew Brees. See, mm-hmm. But I think if the, if the franchise had faith in Brees to be able to come back from that injury, then the, the conversation wouldn't have happened with Rivers anyway. Well, but, yes, but also think about this. It was New Orleans who took a gamble on him after he failed the physical with Miami. Well, that's just the Dolphins being dumbasses. Yeah, why do you think Nick Saban is like, to hell with this, I'm going back to college? Mm-hmm. From LSU, they are the San Diego Superchargers. Super you know why he went back to college? Because he's a better operating budget at Alabama than he did at Miami. Anyway, so I'm going with I'm going with Philip Rivers. I think that the guy's consistency level there was second to none. 224 games started out of 228 played. Uh, what is it, nine straight, ten straight seasons of not missing a single game. And I will be interested to see what Rivers can do in Indianapolis this season. Eh. Eric, you were the other dissenter amongst us for the offensive chargers here, so why don't you take us, why don't you take us into the way back machine once again, as you were wont to do. Do you see, Jason had the perfect song, if only he could have had it queued up. Because LT did not play during the era where they really were the superchargers. Let's go back. A legend. The first ever quarterback to throw for 40,000 yards at the end of his career gone. So you turn to a young rookie from the University of Oregon. A bold head coach in Don Coriel that says, you know what? I like your arm. I'm going to use it. We got receivers. We got weapons. Let's throw it around the yard and see what happens. What do you get? A man who led the NFL in passing yards four times. 
led in completions and attempts twice, completion percentage once. 43,040 yards, 254 touchdowns, albeit yes, with 242 interceptions. Good enough to be in the Hall of Fame, six-time Pro Bowler, two-time All-Pro, Dan Fouts. If it wasn't for him leading that Superchargers offense throughout the 70s all the way throughout most of the 80s, where would San Diego be right now? I don't know. Let's where try, would they be? Let's try unmuting my microphone before I ask this question. Correct me if I'm wrong. Before the Rams and the Chiefs played the Monday night debacle that they played a couple of years back, wasn't Fouts also involved in the highest scoring game in NFL history up to that point? No. First of all, that wasn't even the highest scoring game in NFL history. The highest scoring game in Monday Night Football history was between the Packers and the Redacteds. That one finished 48-47. And the highest game in NFL history was played way back in 1966. That one ended 72-41. I believe the Giants, they were involved and I think they won that game. I'm going to have to double check that one. Okay, so Eric got his point back on them from earlier in the show with Ken O'Brien. I never said they drafted Ken O'Brien. I said Todd Blackledge because he was regarded as the worst quarterback out of that class. Don't start I... shitting on me about technicalities. I hey, said... hey, and it was you need Ken to calm O'Brien. down. You're being too loud. Do we have a mute button for him? I don't think so. <clears throat> Tonight's episode has been brought to you by Devil Ants. India Pell All right. You you finish your beer, Randy. Explain why you selected Ladani and Tomlinson. Because to me, LT really changed the way the running back played. I, I believe he was the first running back to have 100 re- receptions in a season. Mm-hmm. If, just completely... Full aspects of the offense went around LT, especially in the early 2000s. Over 13,000 rushing yards, almost 5,000 receiving yards. 28 rushing touchdowns in 2006. Oh, and he was a Jet for two years, so there you go. He wins. He vaulted way up the career all-time rushing touchdown was just in that season. He jumped up like what? Some... 50, 60 places? Yeah, I mean, LT was, I mean, when you think of LT, you naturally think of the greatest LT of all time. Uh, that won our poll. Uh, you're welcome, Harry. Uh, but also, I mean, also you got to throw in Daniel Thompson. I mean, he was the modern day, um, and I want to make this comparison. A lot of people may chastise me for it, but he was uh, – the second coming of Barry Sanders, uh, just in the style of running. He had a re- very similar style that Barry Sanders have, that real lateral movement that basically bent his body uh, almost perpendicular. Yeah, see, I'm drunk and I can use big words. Uh, to the field and would just humiliate defenders trying to tackle him, leaving them grabbing nothing but air. I don't start attempting do. your augmentation of your vocabulary by being supercilious. Get yeah, you I'm I'm discombobulated on the sector plane of the right angle of the hypotenuse of right, what is right, what right, is right, what right. Damian Thomas, Thomason's ankles when his linebacker was engaging in uh, porpoise uh, collision. Porpoiseful? No porpoise. Those fucking dolphins. <laughs> Well, that's, that's because that's you're not accounting Miami's the fault. true value it's of Miami's the vector calculus. <laughs> Jesus. Where I have to be the dad on this show, but every now and then. He started it. Well, that's the first one Eric's seen. I'm gonna... <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. All right, let's move on. Okay. <laughs> What's fucked up? Yes. Man? I'll pop the entire panel with that one. All right, moving on. Um, defensively, with an honorable mention to Sean Merriman, as Eric is going to 
dis- display as well. <laughs> Literally, the guy had the best name in football and was one hell of a talent to match. Unanimously, the Charger selection defensively is Junior Seau. I mean, Eric, no real question about that. Again, yes, with the limelight being brought on concussion, CTE, and another tragic, unfortunate ending. Yes, even though he had his time with the Dolphins and the Patriots. I mean, if you think oh. about Chargers defense, especially on that Super Bowl team in 94, although... Yeah, it didn't end well that night. Yeah, Junior Seau was the guy. <laughs> uh, Jason, buy or sell best defensive name in football history? No, nah, I mean, if we're strictly going by names, haha, Clinton Dix is, is up there. Um, but, I mean, Seau, Seau is, a, um, is a nice name. Like, uh, I do have to give the honorable mention to Merriman. But I think say out uh, edges him out because of the impact he had to that team and what he did for that team, being that force and that anchor on the defensive side. Randy. Oh yeah, I mean when you you think defense, you think Junior Seau, over a decade with the team, fantastic player. I, I'm I've been sitting there trying to think of a, a better name. <laughs> Since you brought that up, Dick Buckus maybe that, that's a good one. But but for a defensive player, Seau just fits perfect. So the Chicago Bear greatest of all teams defensively, Dick Buckus. And you can listen to that in our archive at the W two M Network online at Speaker Podbean, the or anywhere website. else, or anywhere else you choose to listen to your favorite podcast. Eric, what's the website? W2Mnet.com. Thank you. 56 and a half career sacks, 1,522 career tackles. That is not a misprint. 11 forced fumbles. Say I only played, what was it, 11 seat? Oh, more than that. Wow. Say I played 19 seasons. Holy shit. impressive but i was just gonna say dick buckus maybe but i still say say out especially when it comes to a defensive player because that is literally what he made receivers and running backs do they said out when you got hit by a junior you knew you had been hit uh just like steve atwater just throwing that out there I'm going to have to look up that, uh, that Okoye Atwater hit because I don't oh, think it's, it's It's brutal. It's it's a hit. Speaking of hits, you know which one I was just reminded of this past week? Uh, 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 hit. The Napoleon um, Kaufman Monday Night Football. The back of the hit. Oh, uh, the boomstick. Um uh, yeah, I, me and Robert Foster had this discussion about that McAfee hit. Somebody said that McAfee was just a punter, and I'm like, "Look, please refer to the to the boomstick hit uh, in his highlight reel, and then come back and tell me he was just a punter." But see that that will be the that is going to be foreshadowing. That will be my uh, Colts greatest of all time, Pat McAfee. Uh, speaking of which, we are two weeks away from the AFC South here on, well, technically three because we're going to do, do a news and notes episode this week. But we are two episodes of Greatest of All Teams away from the AFC South. The NFC South is up next in Greatest of All Teams. That would be Carolina, New Orleans, Tampa Bay, and Atlanta, which should make for some interesting discussions on some of those team, on some of those players. But that'll be in two weeks. Next week, we come back at you with a news and notes episode. We've already laid a couple of teachers for you for that for at the, from the start of the show. I don't feel the need to expand upon that. And, yeah, I think that's going to wrap us up for this episode of Greatest of All Teams. Uh, Randy, where can people find you online? Yeah, you can find me on uh, Twitter, at Randy Isbell. And if you play video games, you can check out my new podcast, uh, 
Chapter Select. It is also all over the W2M network. Uh, so check it out there. Jason, where can people find you online? And where can people vote in, for the polls on the greatest of all teams? Oh, well, I do have two polls up. Uh, one is on my personal at um, – yeah. They're standing <laughs> upright. Um, they're at full attention. Whatever. I, I'm, I'm a couple of beers in. I got whiskey, Dick. I ain't going to lie. Um, just throwing that out there. It's what happens when you get married. Back um, to the back to the website, please. But you-, you can vote on one uh, at my personal at Turkey Glue eight twenty two. I promise this week only. I won't tell you to go fuck yourself yet. And the second second one, no, I'm, this is my vacation week. I'm pretty mellow. I've got a lot more shit to worry about than telling people to go fuck themselves. The second poll is at the at W two M Chairman. Uh, both polls will be running for the next. Um, 24 hours uh, per this recording. So uh, it will close um, at 11 p.m. on July 27th. So I know we have a rabid fan base that wants to get out there and vote like their motherfucking life depended on it. So please go vote and prove me right yes, yet again so I can, you know, rub salt on Harry's wound uh, more, uh, more often than one. Literally, we're on the same side of both of these polls. Well, it doesn't matter. You're going to be on the wrong side. I'll always be right. <laughs> Eric, well, wait, wait a minute. Don't don't tell me you're going to be one of those like even though I'm wrong, I'm right. Because yeah, we're already in a weird situation with all of that. That's not it, get political, no, Eric. Even though I'm wrong, I'm drunk. It doesn't matter. Now that's Eric, acceptable. Eric, where can people find you online? Oh, most of the time at Squid Sports Head on Twitter. Uh, granted, if uh, Australian football matches weren't on live at 2 in the morning and around other times, I would be live tweeting them as well. And schedule pending, we've got a lot to wrap up with myself and Rachel Krieger on Soccer to the Max. You may be also seeing that. But if you wanted to talk other things like tutoring and whatnot, you can find me on Facebook. Under Eric Watkins, you know the drill, recliner, glass of wine, laundry, yada yada. And naturally, if you're looking to slide into my DMs on Twitter and undergo a thorough vetting process, then you will gain access to my dark Twitter, my Snapchat, my Telegram, where things have really been crazy, and uh, all of the different good stuff, it's even OnlyFans, especially over the last week. This blog brought to you, as always, by the fine folks at Rick's TNT, LLC. Affiliated with Dun & Bradstreet, website coming soon. And whatever you do, if you're a member of this podcast, don't scroll back in the group chat. It's for your own best interest. Randy, I'm talking to you with that. <laughs> he gives me the thumbs up. All right. You can find me. You can, you can find me. Anything. You can find me online at ATB The Eagle. Easier to message me on Facebook or Messenger. Harry brought her there. I will... Respond to anything wrestling, sports related there. So happy sports are back. At least some of them. Baseball's back, and I can't be more excited. Go Braves. I know Eric likes the Rays. I, I have Randy hope. Wearing, I have hope for once. I see Rand, Randy wearing his Yankees cap. For this particular weekend, I was rooting for the Yankees, if only because it hurts the Nationals. You can root for us for the next four days, too. You get the Phillies. But the, the Phillies aren't, aren't a threat. You can still root for us. Jason, do you have a – oh, yeah, the Cubs. How'd they do this weekend? Fuck, I don't know. I've been too busy going in debt. Kyle – what are you talking about? I think Kyle the Cubs Hendricks, went one and two. Kyle Hendricks had the first opening day shutout by a Cubs pitcher since 74. So the That's Cubs something went two noting. And yeah, two and one. So yeah, that means I'm... all four of our teams are two and one. This could make for an interesting discussion going forward on the season of the kickoff. I just love the uh, fact that – I mean, not to go way off, off base on, on baseball, but I love the fact that it was, what, 24 teams came into today 1-1. One and one. <laughs> It was great. It was fun. All I'm going to say is the only thing that I've seen on baseball is the absolutely amazing, heartwarming thing that Anthony Rizzo did on first base. Oh, bringing the hand sanitizer out. It's so great. Yeah, I, I love Rizzo. My my favorite moment was 
Adam Duvall absolutely disrespecting Jeff McNeil's dog. All I'm saying is, for the first time really ever, I actually went and bought a baseball card. There's going to be plenty of baseball discussion going forward. In addition, hockey and the NBA are both about to start back up as well. We will become a much more inclusive sports podcast once that happens, but our focus will still be football. And that's hockey talk. And that's puck nuts. For the Rays, Randy Isbell, the unprofessional Jason Teasley, the anchorman Eric Watkins, I'm your host. My name is Harry Broadhurst. You have been listening to the kickoff, greatest of all teams, AFC West edition, a presentation of the W2M Network at w2mnet.com. In addition, you can find us on all of your favorite podcast services, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Spreaker, Podbean, CastBox. Hey, Eric, guess what? Spotify is here. And I'm drunk. I don't really have anybody to call a dick this week, though. Oh, Mark Emmert's still a dick to me. I hear the name Tori's a dick. The views and opinions of Jason. <laughs> Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll talk to you guys later this week with our News and Notes catch-up edition of the kickoff. We are a presentation of the W2M Network.